You will want something of a summation then. The death of childhood's limitless possibility. Repeat, repeat. The death of childhood's limitless possibility. Repeat, repeat. The death of childhood's limitless possibility. True heroism, true heroism, true, true, true heroism. True heroism, true heroism, true, true, true heroism. Will that work? True heroism is minutes, hours, weeks, uh, yeah. year upon year of the quiet. It's precise. Thursday, uh, February 10th, 2022, uh, coming to you uh, recorded from Long Beach, California, where it was 88 degrees today, Luke. Whoa, I didn't uh, know that. It, it, it was 88 <laughs> degrees. Um, and uh, I don't have... I don't have a name for this. Uh, podcasts that aren't that you haven't listened to. The podcast. The yet. page no. after the other page. <laughs> um, no, this is just, uh, I don't know, the podcast length episode thing is just uh, maybe just a one off. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Depending on if I kill this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it very much. Uh, <laughs> Depends on you. Uh, speaking of a which, terrible first guess. <laughs> speaking of which, ah. uh, I have uh, my former and technically current roommate because he is in my room. Huh. Uh, and you know, Luke, I don't know if you noticed, but there is a yoga mat right over there that you could just roll on the floor, and that could be a bed tonight. Why would and I do that? Be, uh, we could be roommates again. It looks so uncomfortable. Well, it's, we, it's more thick than I'm used to for a yoga mat. It looks actually like a Pilates mat, I would say. Oh, well. Just going to put that uh, up. You know how I roll. Um, ha! Uh, and today, we are going to be discussing... Uh, Luke, what are we going to be discussing? Uh, it's a book by uh, David Foster Wallace, oh who God. is an author. And its name is The Pale King. There we go. Um, yeah, so I, um, so we have done this sort of type of thing before, uh, where we did kind of, uh, I, I, I did a trial run podcast, It'll, it, you know, hasn't seen the light of day and that's okay. That's probably for the best. Um, but you and I, uh, have done this type of thing before with, uh, it, it was about a year and a half ago with, uh, uh Charlie Kaufman's Aunt yeah, Kind. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> what did you think of Charlie Kaufman's Aunt Kind? I like Charlie Kaufman, um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's probably... Uh, Sorry, look, Charlie. um, uh, admirable attempt. Well, maybe not admirable. It was an attempt. It was definitely an attempt. Um, probably better than I would do. And probably... I haven't published enough, so yeah. I'm not one to talk. Yeah. And, uh... uh uh, no, it's probably not better than what I uh, could do. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, look at that. <laughs> hey, yo. Um, no, so uh, we're going to talk about um, The Pale King by David Foster Wallace. So uh, coming into this, uh, Luke, what is your um, – okay, so I'll actually talk briefly about kind of my uh, background with David Foster Wallace. Right. Um I have read all of his books, uh, or all the important ones. Whoa, um, okay. Haven't read the biography, haven't read whatever his, like, master's thesis thing that's, like, on fate and free will, I think. There's a philosophy thing he wrote. Haven't read Signifying Rappers. So, again, uh, I've read all the important things uh, and all the garbage. Uh, <laughs> who knows if I'll get around to it. Uh, Luke. <laughs> Uh, what's your background with David Foster Wallace? Um, I have not read all of his stuff. I've barely read any of his stuff. Uh, I so <laughs> I watched a movie called uh, Brief Interviews with Hideous Men, which yep. was directed by John Krasinski. It was. It was very strange. Uh, did not know that was a D David Foster Wallace book. Yeah, but watching it... I liked it. I actually really liked it. Okay, I was like, oh, John it, Krasinski, wow. I was in high school, so I don't really know if I, my opinions were valid at that point. Uh, and then later that same year, my mom gave me uh, the This Is Water, I think, okay. which is like the commencement speech. Also really liked, that was the first time I actually heard his name. Then years later, I tried to read Infinite Jest, still haven't finished it, and it's an ongoing joke for me at least that nobody has ever finished the book. Um, I liked it a lot. I still haven't finished it. 
but uh, this is the first time I actually finished a big book of his. There's a lot of stuff. Well, you're also. I'm gonna. Uh, yeah, you're in the same boat with uh, with Matt. <laughs> with yeah. <the> former <laughs> Matt. He has. He has definitely started and made. You know, like multiple. I would say two to three hundred page attempts at reading. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. It's like uh, multiple attempts, and each time I just, you know. Yeah. I get lost. It's, uh, it, I, it, it happens, man. Okay, so going into this novel, I I suggested this as a you know as a buddy read. Uh, what 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 were you expecting? <laughs> well, I, did, I I don't think I knew it was a book about the IRS at all until I think maybe you talk about it. You told me like to watch your I don't know thing about what you're gonna read this year, and so I watched that. I think you might have talked about what it was about. So I I didn't really know what I was getting into until I started reading it, and even then I didn't really know what I was getting into until I finished it, and even then I don't know if I actually know what I just read, but like. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. Sure. Um, and uh, do you know, uh, what do you, have I told you anything about my personal experience, like reading it? No. All right. So, uh -huh. so uh, I, at many times in my life, have said that this is my favorite book of all time. Oh, shit. Of yeah. all time? Holy yeah. shit. Whoa. Now, uh, Wait, uh, when did you I read won't it first? Say that today. I'm sorry. When did you read it first? I read this 10 years ago. Okay, you were like, at that point how old? <laughs> I was, uh, well, I'm 30 now, so I guess I'm uh, 20 then. Hey, you're 30, oh, dude. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I read it when I was 20. It came out um, 10 years ago, you know, like in, I think it came out that January 2011. Sure. Um, or maybe it was, no, you know what? It came out. I read it in 2012. It came out tax day 2011. <laughs> it came out on tax day. Aww, it came out on tax day. It's a, it's a good gimmick. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I mean, there were, are multiple reasons, I guess, sort of why this is my uh, my quote unquote favorite book. I, I like I said, I won't uh, call it that today because I'm uh, these days Ten I'm years feeling old. more like. I've got tears of books. Oh, you know, like, <laughs> like tears in your eyes. <laughs> T-I-E-R. Um, and so, like, this is this is in Top whatever tier. that upper, right, upper right. echelon is. Gotcha. But um, it's it's hard, I think, to actually have a singular favorite book. At least that's how I feel today. Maybe I'll feel different in a week. Um, <laughs> and so this, uh, I mean, I read this book at a really important time in my life. And it. Also, strangely, uh, this was the first David Foster Wallace book. I oh, read. shit. Right on. Yeah. Um, I I was familiar with him. I had read, I think I had read one essay out of Consider the Lobster. And yeah, I don't think I had really read much else. And this was, uh, I remember I got the my first copy from the local library um back in texas uh and it was just like i uh, multiple times um especially at that library so like their new book section is on the first floor right as you come in so it like immediately grabs your attention and i leave through um anyway so <laughs> does it <laughs> well, okay whatever you know what some of us are uh cultured okay okay <laughs> um, i spilled water on myself so um but a lot of what i would do especially with those new books is that i'd check them out and then like never read them and i checked this out probably like you know, two or three weeks before i even started reading it um and then i just ended up reading it and um, did you read it like not like obviously all in one sitting but like yeah but like over a month over a month okay yeah it was, I think the, I, I actually remember the Goodreads dates, I'm pretty sure, uh, January 29 to like March 5. <laughs> That's weird that you remember that, but okay. <laughs> well, there are lots of things that I remember about this book. Yeah, I also actually will probably remember like all the different moments of my reading of it, so I guess I shouldn't find it too strange. Don't make fun of me, Luke. Huh? Don't make fun of me. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I will probably um, continue to be funny. <laughs> okay, so uh, that that's kind of our preamble. I uh, I, I prepared uh, an invocation 
by which I mean I'm uh, going to read um, a quote um, uh, that's not from this book, but I'm going to use it to sort of frame our conversation, and then I'm going to uh, talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get into uh, a wide-ranging freewheeling discussion. So I'm going to start off uh, by reading... Um, a rather familiar, uh, one of the more well-known quotes from Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. <clears throat> it's been a prevalent notion. Fallen sparks. Fragments of vessels broken at the creation. And someday, somehow, before the end, a gathering back to home. A messenger from the kingdom arriving at the last moment. But I tell you, there is no such message. No such home. Only the millions of last moments, nothing more. Our history is an aggregate of last moments. Okay, so uh, this is like this. This quote comes like it's hard to describe exactly what it's doing. I I, I won't go into like all the weirdness that that this sort of quote happens um, amidst in the book. Yeah, in the context. It's very, it's ostensibly kind of between almost two skin cells. It's like one skin cell is talking to another skin cell, sort of. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have not read Gravity's Rainbow. I've heard a lot about it, and I will someday read it, but yeah. um, uh, anyway, I like the quote. Important. The important images, um, I think, Also, are... can I just uh, quickly interject? Am I allowed to swear? Is this a oh, swear-friendly? Okay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I won't because I'm better than you, but no, cool, I cool, probably cool. will swear. Shit is. Um, fragments of vessels broken. Um, this kind of recalls to mind. So I think it was actually Wallace that described infinite jest as um, uh, when he talked about sort of the narrative of it, the fragmented narrative of it. He described it as like reading a broken chandelier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so and I this is. Um, the Pale King, obviously an unfinished novel, it um, it evokes ideas of fragments and of things broken. Um, and uh, the other thing, uh, especially that last line, um, really sticks out to me. The uh, our history is an aggregate of last moments, and um, you know, you can read a lot of things, especially historical, into this quote. Mm. And, um, you know, like the process of history, for instance, the gathering back to home uh, or a messenger from a kingdom is like ostensibly this idea um, that history will uh, make sense and sort of, to put it crudely, end happily. Um, but uh, sort of the the message by the end is that uh, that satisfaction isn't coming um history uh, it turns out isn't even a grand sweeping narrative uh, it's this messy aggregate um it's this combination of everyone's failed attempts at making history um so why is this relevant here well because this novel feels like an aggregate of last moments um sort of the aggregate of the last fictional vestiges we have of David Foster Wallace. It's shaped in a way where you think there must be more, but we know yeah. that this book isn't getting finished. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of, I feel like, what I spend my time thinking about is the difference between what I hoped for and what I got. Um, and I think that's like a metaphor uh, for art and for life and in both you're often aiming for certain ideals and i think in both you will inevitably be disappointed and a lot of human experience ends up being how you navigate that chasm and to explore that particular chasm between what could have been and what was in regards to david foster wallace's the pale king <laughs> that's what is <laughs> my roommate luke merriman and i this is our conversation. <laughs> uh, the theme song. Um, that's hilarious. I literally just had a conversation about this as I was uh, I, outside of the boredom of like 
how I got here. There was cars involved and friends that lent me those cars. But like the conversation I had with my friend, I was like, I'm pretty nervous about this recording because yeah, I, I have a lot to say about the book. I really like the book. But I also, like, am not used to these things. And, like, I know inevitably what I want to say. All the thoughts I have in my head will not inevitably be communicated. Um, hopefully, at least some of them will be. But definitely not the whole of it. And definitely not in my ability to use words. Because I don't speak as well as I wish I did. But, uh, you know, I like I like the, the preface. Um, okay. So, sort of in light with that, one of the things you mentioned that... Um, you wanted to talk about um, was uh, the suicide, David Foster Wallace's death. Um, and so I, I, I guess, um, and feel free to take this question uh, any way you want, um, but sort of how incomplete of a novel does this feel like to you? That's kind of why I wanted to bring it up because <laughs> I don't know, like, in general, I have this, like, view, especially of, like, books written or published post-mortem that, like, <sighs> there's, like, this, like, uh, I don't know, this, like, weird, like, area that they sit in where it's, like, almost, like, a tombstone for a person or, like, a suicide note in this case where it, like, feels like, oh, my God, this is, like, what he was thinking about as he died or something. And, like... I don't know. There's like, there's like so much of that. Um, and I think my, like my first version of seeing this was, I read this book called Mis the mysterious stranger, a short story, mysterious stranger by Mark Twain when I was a kid in middle school and it was like super important, formative for me. And then I learned later that it was like something that was like, uh, abridged or like rewritten after his death by one of his close friends. But then like looking at notes of what he had for the story, the Mysterious Stranger, something like that. I forget. I forget. It's like Mark Twain's one of his last short stories. Okay. And it's published by in like a version that was edited by his friend or close colleague. I don't know. I, I learned later that like the version that was printed was like almost nothing to do with what he wrote. It was almost entirely a <laughs> creation of this other fucking dude. And so I was like so betrayed. But at the same time, like it didn't change the fact that I fucking loved it at the time. And like it meant a lot to me. So, like, <laughs> all that to say, like, when I read this, like, especially, like, reading reading the, the preface given by, I wrote the guy's name down, um, Peach or something? Peach. Peach, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's David Foster Wallace's character. So, when I read that forward, there's, like, that feeling of it, like, okay, like, this guy, it almost feels like a found footage movie or something, where, like, or, like, I don't know, like they do it in some literature where it's like, oh, well, I was looking through my uncle's uh, fucking old treasure chest of notes and I discovered, lo and behold, this story of an yeah. ancient power struggle between IRS agents in the 80s. And like you like follow this like weird, uh, you know, like a gothic horror tale of some sort of shit. <laughs> um, but like it, it feels like that at times. Not because that's the nature of the story, but, like, that's the circumstances of its existing in the world. Yeah. And sometimes I can't divorce the idea that, like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I think, like, in some way, David Foster Wallace, like, even in the book, he, like, asks the reader or, like, the book, I don't know, asks the reader, like, look at everything everything is data and the the process of focusing on that data and like closing the aperture of your like your your interpretation of all the facts that you're being thrown at is like the process of of living or of of understanding the universe or something and like the the fact that he killed himself is like something i can't divorce from the concept yeah. that he's talking about so like in some way Maybe he didn't want this published. I don't know. But, like, in some way, his act of killing himself becomes a piece of this text. Yeah. Like, it is actually a part of the text. Which, I don't know that that's, like, a thing that he wanted or, like, was planning. And maybe it was just a dark moment where he didn't have that view of the act. But, like, invariably, it becomes a part of the text that I have to read into it. 
and it's part of all this information that I'm forced to deal with. In yeah. The tech. Um, absolutely. So, and I don't remember if some of this information is like in that actual introduction, but, um, uh, I know like, I know fairly well what the circumstances of, so they, um, so when David Foster Wells killed himself, his, uh, his wife, uh, came home, found him. And, uh, one of the things, um, uh, shortly after she went into, uh, the garage. I think she went into it with his agent, Bonnie Nadell, and um, they found uh, the story goes that there was like a desk lamp, like lighting about 250 pages of drafts of The Pale King. Oh. And there was uh, even like some kind of note, I think, um, that was basically like this should be enough for like an advance from. Little oh, Brown. I see. Or, okay. Um, so it was something that he did fragmentary as it was he w like prepared it at least in a way to you know to at least get a paycheck to, <laughs> to get some kind of right of right it. um and uh so there is kind of that um behind it and uh and again uh sort of the circumstances of his um uh killing himself was that he uh, at one point, uh, this was when he was out in Pomona teaching at Cal Poly, and he, um, around 2007, he went off the antidepressants he had been on for like two decades at least, and um, they're called MAOIs, and they're a way, way older kind of um, antidepressant, like we're two or three iterations beyond that. Um, and, uh, they were, one of the side effects was like uh, stomach pains and an upset stomach or something. And so he was having problems with his stomach. He went off of those, um, and immediately, well, not immediately, but soon after plunged into a depression. So they put him back on those and like, it didn't take like he, anyway, so it, it was about, um, kind of my understanding was it, it, it was about a year before he, um, finally uh did the deed um but uh yeah as for like um I, you're absolutely right about his his sort of specter and death uh uh hangs over this book um but it's also um it, it also like <laughs> doesn't deal with um uh, suicide and depression nearly as much as like infinite justice. no it's not like it was something yeah like constantly occurring in the book it, like yeah. i think there's at least one mention that i remember um yeah because um it's in the drinians section um obviously the uh God, the meredith rand that's her name i think um because she's put in a hospital for anyway um so there definitely is that um the uh yeah what's interesting about this book is that um like it's <laughs> it's obviously um so as i said i read this book first and so sort of my reading through the rest of david foster wallace became um partially almost like a discovery of all the through lines that led to the pale king that's an interesting because i was also feeling that when when i finished it like i was i finished the actual book of it and then after that part there's like all the like addendum notes that were in his pile of notes that helped expand that and then like i got to the end of that section of notes and I was like, okay, <laughs> but what? And so, like, I feel like, <laughs> like, finishing the book, like, almost all of David Foster Wallace can be encompassed by the Pale King. Like, the Pale King is all of his work, almost. Like, not actually in publishing form, but, like, like if you look at it, it's all this part of, like, an unfinished history of a person. Like you said, like, it's everybody's uh, kind of a... Uh, 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 um, narrative that's unfinished not exactly put together all the way and that just ends for everyone so there's like a certain i brought up um like infinite jest because that's kind of the uh you know that that's the depression book that's the uh 
and, and that book is largely about entertainment. Uh, and this book is kind of the mirror opposite. Yeah, this book about, is about boredom. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is about uh, kind of the vacuum of, of huh. entertainment. Um, and so, which I found to be a lot more interesting than the book about <laughs> entertainment, yeah, okay. which is hilarious. So, so why is that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's why on purpose. <laughs> I don't know. I think. Can I ask, uh, what's how far into Infinite Jest have you gotten? I, I, I want to say pretty far. The problem is, like, as I'm reading it, I'm also reading the footnotes. So, like, I have one book bookmark. Yeah, that's how the book works. Yeah. So, like, you know, you have one bookmark where, like, you are in the narrative. And then this other bookmark is where you are in the footnotes. And I know at some point in between the footnotes start. So, I might be close to the end. I really don't know. There's a lot of footnotes in that fucking book. So, like. There's about 100 pages of footnotes. Yeah. So, I, I feel like I'm, like, maybe three-fourths. But oh, I don't actually know. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's really interesting how... Okay, do you know... Again, I'm going to probably repeat myself. Do you know why... Like, what is it specifically... What are some specific things about, I guess, the motif or theme of boredom that, like, really stuck out to you? Oh, well, for me... <laughs> I don't know. I f for me, like, the, the theme of boredom often connected to this idea of, of focus and, and anxiety, which, which to me is, like, interesting. I, I had never really conceived of boredom as something linking to anxiety or, like, even depression. Where, like, that, that section that I think we... Well, you were the Lane Dean yeah section. the Lane Dean section like he that's one of the sections where he talks about suicide he's like the one thing that like makes him want to kill himself I think it says that the first time he's ever thought about suicide yeah. is while he's trying to do his the fucking uh, yeah he started imagining yeah. you know high places from yeah exactly it's the, the line or something uh, and he like invokes the spirit of the ghost that like killed himself the mirror guy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like there, there's something in that that I thought was really interesting because I never really conceived of boredom in that way. But like hearing it phrase that or in such close association with it, I do remember like when I was a kid, I had these fits of what I realized was depression. But like at the time, I would have called it boredom. Like just and it, he describes it exactly in that section. It's like a infinite sinking feeling. Yeah. Of just like falling through yourself forever. And, like, that hit me so fucking hard. I was like, wait, what? That's, like, a thing that I'm not alone now. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, that that shit is, like, real to me. And then, and at some point he posits that, like, the – that I think it's, like, in his little foreword that's not a foreword. Um, yeah, it's the, the author's <laughs> foreword that yeah. comes about 80 pages into the narrative. It's this hilarious. is also – you bring up an interesting point, but just as an aside, this is uh, – Actually, no, there's there's a story called Good Old Neon where he gets meta with it at the end. But uh, I believe, aside from that story, this is the only uh, book in which he himself is a character. Is a character. That was the other thing which makes me feel like whether or not like it was a part of the plan, it uh, sounds like it wasn't, but like... That suicide, like it's it's the one of the few books where he's actually a character in it and his character dies writing it so like it's just like hard to divorce this thing but anyway that's that was the tangent <laughs> um yeah it's uh i i mean i don't i i remember like as a kid i don't know that <laughs> I, for me i you hit upon anxiety and how um you know boredom can often be connected with anxiety and actually there's uh one of the things yeah, because one of the things that in that section, and by the way, for readers at home, this is subsection 30, shoot, 33. Um, and um, one of the things that Lane Dean is thinking about is like the uh, where the word bore comes from. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is really interesting. Um, and then uh, I'm just going to read uh, a bit here. Um and then suddenly up it pops, bore, as if from Athena's forehead, noun and verb, participle as adjective, whole nine yards, 
Origin unknown, really. We do not know. Nothing on it in Johnson. Partridge's only entry is on board as a subject complement in what preposition it takes, since board of as opposed to with is a class marker, which is all that ever really concerns Partridge. Class, class, class. Okay. Um, and uh, he gets to thinking about how, uh, you know, boring is like literally like drilling into. Mm. Um he, and like something about hollowness too. Yeah, I, I, I think that's in there too. Um, which is uh one of the anyway, so to bring it back to um uh kind of my childhood, I I wouldn't uh I, I look back at my childhood and realize um that I just had like <laughs> really bad like control over anxiety. So I um so David Cusk is one of the characters. Oh, dude, Cusk freaks yeah. me the fuck out. Uh, David Cusk is like a character that I identify with a whole bunch. <laughs> I know. It scares know. me. Yeah, Him yeah. and Sylvanshine so, like scare me. It's <laughs> like too much. Wait, Sylvanshine scares you? Yeah, that's just like the way that they deal with like constant like yeah whatever. They're like different versions of like fixation on things. For yeah. Sylvanshine, it's facts. For Cusk, it's sweating. <laughs> yeah, with Cusk, it's well. I remember. I it, there's a particular day I remember when I was. Um, uh, in like driver's ed um, <laughs> and I like I took it at just like a driver's ed school in the summer and uh, I was wearing uh, a shirt and I basically I, I did the thing that Cusk did oh, where no. I became too aware of myself like yeah. sweating like yeah. hitting out and so I kept on like trying to pinch more and more of my shirt under my armpits and then i just Wait, kept on what? sweating more and oh more and so like your sweat spot on the shirt was getting bigger and yeah bigger. <laughs> and i was just like trying to you know stay completely <laughs> quiet during the whole thing and i was trying to like get out as soon as i could <laughs> um but yeah there's um that's one of the things that wallace is so good at capturing is kind of like one of the um uh, I don't know monikers or or names of the genre of fiction he does mm. is hysterical realism. Okay, I don't know if you ever heard of that. <laughs> no, but it immediately like makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I that's one of my like favorite uh, when people ask me. So what kind of stuff do you write? I'm like, oh, hysterical realism. <laughs> they don't know what that. And means then they run away. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so, uh, yeah, there were, there were some, so David Cusk is this character that has like, um, you know, just this profusive, uh, sweat problem. And David Foster Wallace also uh, talks about how he has like an extreme, had like an extreme sweating problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if it, it seemed so real that like it had to come from experience. The thing that I was linking it to is like. Uh, at one point he talks about like his face and his like acne problems or whatever and I felt well, that's like the character David Foster Wallace yeah like, yeah yeah so like when he was talking about that I was like oh maybe he's like connecting the the two things like yeah. he he just has an awareness of these kinds of problems in a person <laughs> yeah well, it just seems too real <laughs> there, there's a great amount uh like throughout all his work um there is a great amount of I mean, self-awareness, self-consciousness, but also a great ability to uh, be able to just kind of capture that. Um, you mentioned uh, Sylvan Shine, um, and this is Claude Sylvan Shine is like the character that I really wanted to see, like sort of where he's he would go the most. Yeah, he's, he's so fascinating because um, he is. Uh, he's like a GS nine, and he's um, trying to pass. It's to be he's CID, to pass the CPA, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it says yeah. in some he's place, in CID. It, yeah, it says he wants to be CID or like the investigative branch. I think yeah. that's what it was saying. At I some think point. that's yeah. Might have been a note though. Um, I don't know. It might have been. I but he wants to because does he work? I can't even remember if he works for Laryl or Glenn Denning. I feel I like think it's he Laryl. it's Laryl. Yeah. yeah, it's like him and him and Reynolds are like 
Merrill's team that like yeah, and he and Reynolds are they the two that live together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they have like this weird ambiguous relationship. Yeah, it's that it's, was another of my favorite chapters was like their phone conversation. I think yeah. is like beautiful. <laughs> it's like some of the best. Like I would if I wrote that dialogue in a screenplay, I would be so proud of myself. <laughs> Uh, but instead, you just get to be on the outside yep. looking in. Um, <laughs> exactly. Always. <laughs> so I wanted to read, um, and I'm going to start mid-sentence because this, uh, it, I think it is like literally a page-long sentence. Um, so I'm going to start kind of at the very end. This is from subsection two, and this is when we're introduced to Claude Silvenshine, and he's um, sort of obsessing over um, a lot of different things. Um but this, I think, really captures, uh, well, a lot of what we're talking about. <clears throat> An oceanic impression so literally obliterating that Sylvanshine was cast or propelled back in on himself and felt again the edge of the shadow of the wing of total terror and disqualification pass over him. The knowledge of his being surely and direly ill-suited for whatever lay ahead and of its being only a matter of time before this fact emerged and was made manifest to all those present in the moment that Sylvanshine finally and forever lost it. Um, I don't, uh, I don't remember reading this uh, the first time, but I can't help but imagine that this would have really spoken to me. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the breadth uh to which I felt surely and direly ill-suited to just kind of life yeah. or whatever lay ahead uh, <laughs> it cannot be expressed deeply. Yeah. Enough. So I, as a bit of background for my first reading, uh, one of the reasons um, that uh, this is one of my favorite books, but I'm not actually saying that. One of the reasons that I love this book so much is because it was the book that I was reading while I came out of like my depression. Oh, okay. Um, out of like my first big, out of my, my first big <laughs> boy, uh, <laughs> depressive episode that gotcha. lasted for like six months. Okay. Um, and so like, you can't help, but obviously sort of be biased. And I want to also be clear, like this book itself did not bring me out of my depression. Gotcha. It was like, it, 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 like I was going to therapy and I was getting right. on drugs and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You don't want to attribute it to the book itself. Uh, very, no, very much not. But it was, um, uh, you said it hit you at the right intersection of things in your life. Yeah. Um, would you, uh, would you be willing to talk about what intersection, uh, that it hit you at that made it yeah. so Yeah. Well, uh, it's like a few things like, similarly like not i don't know i don't know like i have never been like clinically depressed or clinically diagnosed as depressed but i'm guessing like over the last whenever the pandemic started few years i've been in a cycle of depression and maybe like fits of manic um i don't know whatever but like so this last year, I, I've just been kind of like listless without direction. Um, and and like coming to the end of the year, I was really hoping to get some things accomplished. Didn't get accomplished. Not entirely out of my fault, but because at least for the very least, I, I couldn't motivate uh, other people to accomplish the things that I was I was um, working together on with them on. Um, but so like en leaving this year, I was like kind of low and entered this new year. <laughs> Um, on a flight to Chile, reading the same section with Sylvan Shine on his flight yeah. into this this crazy world of the IRS. And so at the same time as I'm reading this book that's at least in part about like civic engagement and like how do you deal with all these fucking like useless data pieces that don't make sense or like are super fucking boring. And at the same time as I'm like slogging through this, I'm like chopping wood and like lugging wood through my brother's farm and then like i'm watching him go through like his little version like he has a uh, position in the municipal government and so like he's like really active in his community and local government and like he's in this position where like 
with the new president and stuff like there's so much potential for change yeah in his immediate like grasp and in the immediate grasp of the the uh, i'm a Mapuche person so like the indigenous community there and it's more power than they've ever had before they're like actually getting to write a law which is like whoa it's are they are they rewriting the constitution there? Is that what's going on? Yeah, they're rewriting the constitution. So, like, in part, what I saw was also uh, 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 just real quickly. What's the <laughs> president's name? Uh, Gabriel Boric. <laughs> Boric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boric is what I hear. Uh, my Slavic friend says is, is Boric, but they say Boric. And uh, uh, what party is uh, he associated with? I, I couldn't tell you. He's left. Yeah, that's he's all. I'm from the socialists. Yeah, he's also 34 years old, which to me is more mind-boggling than like his political <laughs> associations. I just can't even conceive of a 34-year-old president. That's crazy. That's like baby boss or boss baby. Boss baby, uh, uh, which we'll get to later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so all this shit is happening at the same time. So like, the I feel like, in some way, this book to me resonated as like a call to action, like. Well, because there's a lot of talk about, like, this moment of childhood into adulthood. Like, mm -hmm. what is this change? Several characters go through it explicitly in the story or at the least talk of childhood's yeah. limitless possibility. Yeah. And so there's, like, a lot of feeling like that in this moment in my life, which we'll see if anything actually happens with that. Maybe I'll stay a child. I like childhood. Childhood is forever. You know? it, it suits you well. Can we talk about... Um uh the irrelevant chris vogel subsection 22 yeah this is <laughs> yeah so this is and i, I want to give some background so i'm pretty sure I, i'm pretty sure i read this that they're actually going to publish just that as like a standalone thing this next it year. was very long <laughs> it was yeah it's like 110 or so pages feels right yeah, yeah. uh in and what do you remember happening from that section um well so this, this was another section where i i guess like i i listened to this book in audiobook form at the same time as i was like, reading a pdf of it so like this section in particular because it's so long i had in like different chunks um so i'm not i'm never sure exactly the order of things i think the order of things is in an attempt to describe this like moment of clarity this like a change of childhood to adulthood from his like weird um what do you call it like nation state of like Nietzschean. Na Nietzschean. yeah he's very Nietzsche. yeah he's very he he calls himself a nihilist yeah yeah and like almost like in a unbeknownst way to him like he doesn't realize how like corroded and like empty his worldview is until like post this section of his life yeah. but then this like moment he has in college with an accidental uh class that he walks into changes his life forever he realizes he wants to join the service or he realizes he wants to change and then he finds the service the irs as like a, a vehicle for that change and so he takes that opportunity but like getting to that point in the story is not a through line he like has to describe everything so he describes his fucking childhood he describes his like early meandering college days which resonated very closely with my own um and he describes his father's death <laughs> which his is father's like, gruesome death horrifying <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I was like he killed uh, on the I, the subway. Or yeah, whatever, it's like a the horrific subway accident, which yeah. I thought was fucking hilarious, but I felt so bad. He yeah. also dies, I think, explicitly states. Well, it's it's not explicitly stated what the cause of his death is, like why this event happened. Um, in some way, it almost seems like suicide. <laughs> almost. But um, th at the same time, he uh, I think he like says that, that his dad dies at like 49 years old, which I think is the age that David Foster Wallace died. I think. Oh, is it? I think. Mm, no, that wouldn't have. He was, his dates are 62 to 08. So what does that make? I don't know. 46? Don't know. Good amount. Maybe it's wrong. 40. I don't know why I thought the math added up. Um. Anyway. 
his dad dies a, t- a horrible, gruesome death. Uh, and pretty much his like last memories of his dad are like these really awkward moments where he felt like it completely disappointing to his father. Yeah, like he's literally not even able to catch up to his father, <laughs> who's like shorter than him, but walking much faster. And I think part of the reason why he's like so slow behind him is because he's like annoyed. He's like feeling like he yeah, wants like, to like. Why are you making me do this shit? Yeah, exactly. He wants why, to like why stick am it. I? Why am I meant to uh, expend yeah, any extra? Energy? Yeah, exactly to catch up with you. And then, and then, know, sort of his <laughs> father's like is like, like he, he sees he, all of a sudden like all the the little bits of sort of boredom um, and and extra work become sort of like extra meaningful for him. I, I would say, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, I you didn't bring up what I hoped you were going to bring up, which uh, which is the notion of being primed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was going to ask if you felt like you had been primed for this book at all. Uh, I think in some ways. Like, I feel like lately, whenever I read anything, I'm always kind of in this primed state where, like, it, like, perfect, perfectly resonates with everything that's happening in my ri- life right at the moment that I encounter it, which is only true of literature, very rarely true with, like, um, anything else anymore. But... That's why, like, I gravitated towards film and stuff early on in my life because it had that effect in high school oh, when literature stopped kind of having that effect in high school. And, like, now I see it kind of, like, turning the other way again. Um, but, like, yeah, definitely. Time to go back for a literature degree. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but, yeah, I would say definitely. Um, but I'm not, not in the same ways that I think, like, he uh, talks about was it's like the the first example of priming he gives is like he was watching this like television show yeah, soap, he was opera. The soap opera uh, as the world as turns. the world turns yeah <laughs> and that the notion as the world turns like yeah you are and then there's an announcer uh, <laughs> that is saying you are watching as the world turns and and feeling this kind of existential yeah and well I love. I, I love shit like that. I actually think I read about like that specific scene from somewhere um, in like an article or something, or maybe it, I don't think it was on Wikipedia, but it, I, I remember like reading this whole, you are watching as the world turns as like an excerpt or something from somewhere. Um, it might've just been a book review and that was the thing where I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. I'm going to keep an eye out for it. And then, you know, days, weeks, months later, I saw it at the library and, you know, on and on it went. But it's like, it's equally like really very silly and funny. Um, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, uh, it comes with like an undeniable sort of um, – I don't know. Yeah, you use the words call to action or power or just um, it, it's just like deeply resonant in a really human and meaningful way. And I think that uh, that's one of the things um, that I sort of like about really that. That's, I guess, one of the things that I use as a definition for what really good literature is, where mm. it can sort of be both extremely funny and extremely serious yeah equal measure at the same time yeah um somehow sort of equal and separate i don't know uh go, kind of going off of that i also wanted to know like that that idea of priming he relates it uh to this this other story he has of talking with like a religious like a christian couple yes. and he's talking to like the girlfriend and she describes her like coming to god yeah yeah he's like being the uh the uh what am i cynical atheist <laughs> yeah, he's being like the I, I was gonna say like um like the do you know what i mean when i say new atheist um Just like i think i i think i yeah of, yeah like, yeah the they like feel like they have to like i don't know somehow like, 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 like the richard Dawkins yeah yeah it, uh, <laughs> disprove christianity or disprove religion um it was just yeah it um but yes, he's sort of being that person to uh, this girl, um, and it's the and it's the girl that's talking about being primed, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that says she like feels a call or like feels an urge to pull over at this church. She stops, goes into the service, and then almost at that exact moment, the like the pastor like almost like picks her out of the crowd with his words and with mm. his like action. I forget exactly how it works, but yeah. she feels like completely targeted in that moment, and like that moment speaks to her like as a, a direct message from God. Yeah, Which is, and um, Fogel ends up. Um, I think, I think this is one of the things he sort of talks about where, um, cause he talks about his sort of own conversion experience in this. Um, so, uh, you alluded to it earlier. He goes, he, he goes to the wrong classroom and Wallace takes great pains to, I mean, Fogel takes great pains to describe how like these two buildings are mirror opposite. Yeah. Of mirrors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is another thing. Um, uh, at I think this is at DePaul University, um, and because uh, because Fogel went to like three different places. Yeah, he, he college, was a career collegiate. Which, uh, d as a man that went to at least three different colleges for undergrad, pound my chest to him. Um, but yeah, so he goes to this uh, lecture and he ends up in an advanced tax class as opposed to the one he's supposed to be in. And there's a substitute there and it's um, all these people that are, you know, kind of preparing uh, for final exams or maybe like a CPA type. Yeah. Exam I think it's the, like the big thing. one. Um, and uh, at the end of the review, um, you know, and there's this whole thing about he, Fogel doesn't want to get up like in the middle of the classroom yeah. because he doesn't want to make a scene. Um, and then he's utterly transfixed by, um, cause it's DePaul. It's a Jesuit. Um, he's not a monk. Is he a, just a Jesuit priest, Jesuit priest, um, that, uh, is giving the lecture and, um, <clears throat> he goes on. There's actually this really great, uh, uh, rendition of it online yeah. by Andre Holland. Um, he's uh, like an actor. Um, I I know him from this YouTube video. Gotcha. <laughs> um, gotcha. And uh, I I also uh, used. It's a good uh, monologue. It is a it is a good monologue. It's very theatrical, and I think <laughs> Holland like kind of does it with the sort of again that equal weight of sort of pomp and circumstance and taking yourself seriously, but it's also very funny. Yeah. And it's very, it, it's, it's overwrought basically mm. is what it is. It, the, the line, the death of childhood's limitless possibility um, comes up and uh, he calls the, uh, the career of accounting heroic. Um, one of my favorite quotes of all time is from this book. Um, and it's, uh, true heroism is minutes, hours, weeks, year upon year of the quiet, precise, judicious exercise of probity and care with no one there to see or cheer. This is the world. Um, and that is, uh, that's what, I don't know. That's always, always stuck with me, um, about how, um, you know, Wallace really sets out to kind of uh, uh, basically say that battling with boredom itself is like a heroic pursuit. Right, yeah. That is worthy of heroism. Um, and so that's sort of uh, Fogel's, um, I don't know, we'll call it a, his conversion experience. Um, and. But at the same time, all while he's doing this, because he is ostensibly, because we should talk about this part next, he is talking about the initiative. He is, it's framed within kind of the initiative. And this is an interview he's giving for a documentary that the IRS right. is doing. Yeah. Okay. And um, he's taking great pains to um, uh, always talk about how he's not exactly saying it right. He's like, I'm probably not relating it. To yeah. Way. And he's he's very conscious of the gap between his inner subjective experience yeah. and what he's able to say about it. Yeah. Which um, is always that that's just like another 
thing that you know I think about uh, a lot is just you know, at once, words are very e expansive and and and, and cr create and render our world. <laughs> but there's also this huge. We I I think most people uh, feel this like huge gap between what they can say and um, just sort of what they experience sometimes at a deep and gut level. Yeah, and I feel, I think too, like maybe. I don't know. I I at least read into the the character of of Chris Fogel as being like really closely associated with with uh, the David Foster Wallace character, and probably David Foster Wallace as a person. Where it, like his version of writing kind of tends to do this thing, like you're saying, like it it attempts to describe as much as it can. And then, like, s consciously is unable to do that. Yeah. And it's, like, that that constant, like, war of, like, over-speaking, <laughs> or, like, yeah. uh, circling a, a topic endlessly, and then still feeling <laughs> like it was never truly hit on. Yeah. Which is, like, <laughs> I don't know, super, super relevant to me as a person. <laughs> There's, um, uh, so... The last sort of book of fiction that he completed in his life was called Oblivion. Um, and that's a short story collection. And my favorite is that, I don't know, it's tough to pick a favorite short story of his, but I'll say that one of my favorites, here, I'll, I'll give you my favorite uh, David Foster Wallace stories. Uh, Forever Overhead from Brief Interviews of Hideous Men. And then this one, Good Old Neon from Oblivion. And in good old neon, um, there's a lot of really similar themes in Oblivion, in that whole collection. Um, and there are different stories that, uh, like, were very clearly written alongside right. this. And, and you could tell, like, there's one, uh, it's called The Soul is Not a Smithy, and it's a childhood type of uh narrative in the midwest and it's about this kid being just like almost suicidally bored and and his teacher basically goes crazy and starts writing kill them all on the chalkboard and this kid is basically like uh barely paying attention kind of to it all and he's realizing i didn't pay attention to like this most important right. thing in my life um good old neon though explores this idea that you were talking about about um not being able to get all of the words out. Um, and that's also the one other story where David Foster Wallace goes meta with it. Kind of, sort of. He becomes a character within that story. Um, but uh, he talks about, he uses the image of a keyhole a lot. Hmm. Where like you can only sort of, you know, you want to open the door and get the whole view. And the only bit you're going to get is like that little keyhole. Um, uh, okay. So if we can, um, the initiative, uh, right. what do you this remember is, about this? So this is really interesting to me because like, I see, this is one of those like threads that there's so much more yeah. that like the notes kind of outline and use it as and help to and, expand on. And it's obviously like part of the infrastructure of what, the book was planned to be but even as it sits um it frames a lot of the subsections because a lot of these people are telling us how right. they came to the irs and they're all kind of in this moment of upheaval because of this initiative um i i wanted to talk about talking about the initiative uh the the story itself seems to me like Okay, let me, let me just describe the initiative first. So the initiative is this moment in history as uh, the Reagan administration comes in where they want to change the the IRS so that it uh, it operates more as a business. In, in, in this way, it helps. It allows the U.S. government to, like, posit this, this, this face of, like, oh, we don't want to increase taxes. We want to, like, uh, fuck taxes. And at the same time, in the background, they are increasing their, their commitment to follow up and audit uh, profitable um, uh, tax forms. Yeah, they want, yeah. 
so so it's like i don't know i i i I never knew about this for me this is like a piece of history that i was like uh unaware of completely i i don't know anything about that (laughs) i truly yeah honestly like i don't i don't know the specifics quite of it i mean i know there were a couple different like tax overhauls i feel like that reagan did but um uh yeah the the story at least goes this isn't a history podcast so we're not gonna look it up um but actually history one of the things that i did end up looking this time around was uh in the chris fogel section he talks about a progressive sales tax oh in chicago (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> that shit sounded fucking that, hilarious. That that is a true thing. <laughs> that is a thing that happened and it was obviously as insane. So like the idea is that the more stuff <laughs> you buy, you know, let's say uh you're going to the grocery store, if you ring up a hundred dollars of groceries or whatever, you pay more sales tax on that. It's so fucking as crazy. opposed to if you made four different trips to the grocery store of twenty five dollars. And so what people would madness. do is they would uh you know kind of logically they buy 25 dollars <laughs> stuff pay the lower tax rate do another trip do another trip get in line again and so that causes all these lines um that end up being a huge hindrance and uh being a contributing factor to chris fogel's dad's death um oh yeah yeah it's like directly then, <laughs> i yeah. forgot about it. <laughs> Uh, uh, thanks a lot, liberals. <laughs> um, I don't know. Was it the liberals? Yeah, it had to be the liberals. Um, no, but to bring it back to like the initiative, and then uh, one of the things that the service does is they make this uh, this kind of documentary, so to speak, about why people um, joined the IRS. And I'll say briefly, like in the notes, it's because there's something, there, there's some kind of specific memory or is it just like a, I forget exactly what, they want to get something out of Chris Vogel is sort of the idea uh, behind I it. I forgot. That, I remember the note about it, but I don't remember the, yeah, yeah. the, I remember it being really funny. Oh, I no, I remember what it is. So the documentary crew is being paid hourly for the work. And because they have not been given clear objectives, they see this guy, Chris Fogel, who is like, we'll talk at length about everything, every single detail of his life. So they don't stop him or press him about anything because they are literally just getting a fatter paycheck. Yeah. Because they're not being watched by anybody actually in charge of this project. So they just keep, like, rolling. Yeah, and there's... Uh, okay, so I'm on one of the notes. This is on page 543, notes and asides. Uh, and one of the notes he has is, Film interview a sham? Question mark. Point is to extract from Chris Fogel the formula of numbers. Oh, shit. Oh, no, fuck. You know, I also forgot about that. That is something that's never clear in the in the story. That's yeah, like, that's okay. never, like, really developed. Yeah. Um, but that there is... It's like a sequence of numbers that Chris Fogel knows that allows people to concentrate better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which and... is fucking crazy and hilarious. There's like yeah, there's a whole other part in the in the in the book that is like a lot about this, where there's like this almost occult supernatural. Because we do have the ghosts. Yeah, the ghosts. I can't remember the names. Uh, Blomquist is yeah, the one, Blomquist. the IRS guy who dies at his desk. Um, but like the but the fact psychics and is another exactly, thing and like I think their team um, that. Claude Silvenshine basically gets completely bombarded <laughs> with irrelevant <laughs> facts. Such a good um, character. And, you know, they have this whole history of, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of the, um, like, soothsayers from uh, the times of yore. Oh, it's not yeah. that their predictions were wrong. It's that they were just irrelevant. Irrelevant, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's they would get killed and, off. And so Claude Silvenshine is purportedly this type of person who... Um, gets bombarded with these useless facts. information and and he's thought you know in the notes it outlines kind of like uh they're gonna put him like in the same sort of space as other people as a means to try and hoover up certain hopefully like 
by being in the same space with them, he gets certain important information. That's right. a tactic at one point. Um, okay, sorry, I cut you off, but they were you were talking about occult stuff. Oh yeah, well, so there's like this whole level of like I don't know whatever Meryl Laryl's team is doing. A Meryl Errol Laryl. Meryl Errol Laryl. God, great names always. Um, but like his his team just like is looking for. They're interested in people who will. This is also gathered mostly from notes that are not actually a part of the the book, but are like the yeah. So uh, they're they're part of a group tasked with finding like the most proficient tax examiners, so that they can then battle them against. A machine to prove that a machine could be better than humans that's what i gathered from it i don't know if i'm reading that wrong i it, i remember that yeah vaguely i i'm remembering that is kind of the contours there definitely is uh in we never see like a machine introduced that's yeah, there's thing never that like there's the this, never it's discussed in. in a footnote anada anada something like that ananda ananda what yeah it's like this machine that oh okay. it's like really good at inter i don't i don't fucking okay. know it's yeah, it's yeah. very small in the in the context of everything i've read this but two it, times I remember. <laughs> it's like some acronym for yeah. something but uh there's there's some kind of discussion about in the notes of what the book was purportedly going to be that like was eventually a battle or like a conflict between the old guard and the new guard IRS, the new guard who wants to implement computerized IRS tax examiners to be a more efficient service, and the old guard who has this idea that, um, I don't know, civic engagement and yeah, like yeah, it's about civic focused people. Every, yeah. every sort of uh, uh, tax return should be treated the right. same. Yeah. Um, it, Which. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a fascinating piece to this book that is never like really achieved in the book and like is discussed. Yeah, it's it's in it's the notes almost exclusively. And there are, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's really, yeah. It, it's uh, and and arguably, Luke, it's something that's been under discussed in American culture. <laughs> yeah, um, so <laughs> the battle of humans and machines. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I was actually Terminator. Thinking more, I, I was thinking more <laughs> oh, like God, uh, the, gotcha. the like like the civic duty or the civic right that side of it. Yeah, of um, uh, because we have these. Um, it's Glenn Denning and sort of his like triumvirate troop of people. Um, the, 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 it's an old dialogue scene where they're talking about. Oh, uh, that was another great scene that helps yeah, with the initiative, which I can't can't remember off the top of my head like 23 or something which one it is um no it's not i don't think it's 22, 22 pretty close 22 no no that's not. 19 is it 19 i think so page. that's what i have here give me a page number luke don't have those i'm so sorry okay. um in this section i'll take over since you're fighting it in this section uh i think this is a fascinating like uh, diagnosis of like the American illness or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> the that was actually one of the pieces that hit me really hard as I was encountering this book, which is like this idea of like an infantilized nation or an adolescent nation that that concedes its own autonomy in order to feel like the thrill of life as. Uh, Oh, life beset by uncontrollable outside forces, um, which is the IRS or big government or corporations, whatever you want to call it, which is kind of a scapegoat when when you're the person allowing them to constantly get more power. Um, and, like, the discussion is really interesting because, like, each of the three voices in it, it's, like, Glenn Denning and two other dudes who I don't know who they are, um... But, like, they each, like, kind of move this discussion further and further inside of itself until one of the guys mentions it as, like, a metaphysical, uh, uh, I don't know, like, conflict where um, 
so the individual spirit is is oh manifest i don't know about this wording um individualist spirit is manifested from an existential dread of cosmic insignificance a plight that encourages small acts of character creation and rebellion to assert i am hereness and that the universe can never oh that the universe can never truly provide so like yeah it like uh you feel alone and small and insignificant it's that nihilism feeling that chris fogel has and then and then there's this like uh this oh the giant corporate organism that gets a foot in that door that that feeling of insignificance and they they can use that to to commodify individuality rebellion and the illusion of self-determination personal agency in order for you to like keep going down this cycle of like oh like i'm a fucking rebel because i wear converse or i have a mohawk or i'm I subscribe to this media channel. Well, and the other thing that he like ties it to is how, um, like he literally calls, uh, uh Reagan as, uh, he, he describes it like as, um, uh, a rebel against his own power. Um, yeah. Yeah. How, like, <laughs> yeah. How he the like... messaging of Reagan is that he's against big government, <laughs> but he is the big government. And if you know anything about Reagan, it, like, I think he's the president that expanded l literally the size of the government the most. Yeah. And he is branded though in this way where he is uh, uh, the the small the small government. <laughs> yeah, the, it's the that the same bullshit that every Republican words are. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, <laughs> and it's like, especially funny because like, I mean, obviously look, everything and anyone is more subtle than Donald Trump, yeah. but it is like Donald Trump is so, so overt of, of like all the problems where like Donald Trump, again, a rebel against his own yeah, power. Exactly. He's yeah. constantly, uh, you know, talking about how, how beset he is yeah. upon, you know, by other forces, uh, by the deep state, by whatever. Um, and, you know, he promises radical change, but he's also, like, <laughs> afraid to enact any kind of meaningful change or because at the end of the day he's kind of an idiot and he doesn't really understand how the government works. And so he has to just rely <laughs> upon the existing uh <laughs> structures that are there mm. um but uh only insofar as the structures uh sort of kiss his ass it's it's very fun times we I think, live in yeah no, i know i i that's another thing that that amazes me about i mean i guess just u.s history in general but like the way that this book is able to encompass that that struggle that is happening in this moment in the 80s which was a really pivotal moment in time when you look at like reaganomics and how how the republican party has kind of just followed this doctrine ever since and probably like before with next i don't really know enough about it but but like this 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 fucking story of like of and i i attribute it because my close experience with this is my my personal friends like i i have a bunch of close friends that feel like really bored and insignificant in the eye of politics and whatever big the manness is controlling their lives and yet their their insignificance is like bolsters their own insignificance in that that world where they like push themselves further and further outside of any kind of meaningful meaningful political power or agency mm -hmm. just so that they can like feel that like cathartic like fuck the manness the yeah. the i don't know is what culture feeds us yeah. so like i don't know it feels like really relevant and sad and i don't know how to fix that but it's cool <laughs> to see <laughs> yeah so luke how do you want to fix politics can we i just want everybody to take a step back you know look at each other in the eye and say you know i see where you're coming from and like let's hold hands and work on this together gross. slow clap all right gross
So anyway, <laughs> I would like to uh, murder my political enemies. There we go. All uh, right. That seems like the most <laughs> efficient way <laughs> to do things. I'm okay with that. Too. <laughs> I had a uh, question, um, real quick. The Pale King, is yes. that Mr. Glendening, or it is it? Is because okay. he talks about the. Um, don't the titles like rotate? I think so. It's uh, one of the sections starts and you know nameplates are back or oh what? yeah yeah and they say the pale king i think the and desk names are back this is another plus under glenn denning nothing against the pale king but the consensus is that mr glenn denning is more agent morale oriented and desk names are one example what would your uh desk name be God, i don't, don't want to answer this question <laughs> i uh just pass with it no, just, come on, you gotta spit out some words. Okay, so I just got a Discord message. My name on Discord is Gunko Steve Watkins, so that's my name. Gunko Steve Watkins. Do you know what my name plate at work says? It says my name, Nate Rankin, and then underneath it, it says Director of Antics. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> it's very official. <laughs> I was talking about uh, Oblivion earlier and how there are a couple different... Um, uh, stories in that collection that deal with kind of these, um, well, insane childhood traumas, or in, and and there's a lot um, that ha that happens um, with just like weird childhood stories. Um, uh, do you? We've talked about a couple, um, but you mentioned some other names uh, that haven't been brought up yet. Uh, do, do you have? Uh, any favorites of those kind of childhood characters that we see? So the the ones that like stick out to me um, are uh, Stesic. Yeah. And, and what what kind of kid is Stesic? Stesic is like the perfect goody two shoes kid, yeah. but like at such an intense, obsessive, and impossible level that he's like yes. He's like almost he's essentially dethroned his like parental structures. So his mom is like commits suicide because she's, yeah. she's like so uh, pushed to the side by her own son. Like, I think it says like he wakes up early before she does to like do laundry and get the house ready. Yeah. And she's like a housewife that's essentially been like yeah. outbid or something. <laughs> It's fucking crazy, Stesic. This part about Stesic is fucking hilarious. Um, it also describes his teacher who, like, ha indulges in, like, Secretly hates yeah, him. he, like, yeah. indulges in fantasies of, like, kicking his ass and killing him. Yeah. And then, like, feels so bad about it that, like, he starts mm. to, like, hate himself. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, there's, like, the description of this bullying incident where he, like, is like really beat the shit out of and then like he sends all the people that beat the shit out of him like a message that's like i understand that this could be like a traumatic experience for you looking back at like how you did this horrible thing to somebody it's just like fucking crazy i love it yeah there's also a later section that like talks about later in his childhood where he's like in high school and uh his shop teacher gets in this like horrible accident with in shop class cutting his finger off with a bandsaw and Stesic like whips out his do gooder uh skills to like perfectly uh like suture the wound from fucking I don't know whatever and like saves the guy's life. And then like everybody who who hated him up to this point like realizes like, oh shit, like this is the only guy that's actually competent among us. And like remember throughout the rest of the lives this moment where this kid saved the the shop teacher's life. I don't know. He's a really interesting character to me. Um, he's also in the book as an adult and doesn't exhibit a lot of these traits. Yeah, like, it's like as he, big. Yeah, he kind of sort of grows out of this. Um, and there are other things that are kind of outlined. One of the last scenes in which we see at least from the pov of david foster wallace mm. the the character <laughs> oh, yeah. um is when you know he's tangled up in this bureaucratic snafu about being the wrong david foster wallace because there's uh, an actual like i think gs13 um uh tax whiz from philly that's also named david wallace and so the young uh, david foster wallace is 20 years old and is just like a seasonal employee um 
uh, who's home from college because uh, <laughs> he uh, did a bunch of plagiarism and got kicked out for like a year, um, which uh, I believe is somewhat based on uh, David Foster Wallace does, in fact, purport to have written a lot of papers for people in college. It seemed um, fairly realistic sounding. <laughs> but it's also, like, there's a lot of self-mythologizing right. within it, I, I think. Um, anyway. Um, but, yeah, like, one of the last scenes we see David Foster Wallace in is when he and Len Stesick, like, make eye contact. <laughs> um, and I, I think that there's this, like, uh, it, it's this description of this guy having like the most understanding look on his face in the world and comforting <laughs> kind of thing. And he is like <laughs> the ultimate sort of uh, like agent morale. Uh, I don't know. Paragon. Hmm. Uh, like, like he's uh, I think he's supposed to be a major Lieutenant of Glenn Denning, at least at some point. Yeah. Maybe I think he's so. One of the voices within. Yeah. The, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I, it, that would make sense to me. It's not explicated, so... Yeah. I don't know that any of them sound exactly like a Stesic would sound. I don't know. I don't really know what he sounds like, even. There's also a section where I think it's Stesic that, like, he's going door to door yeah. and, like, saying... And Stesic. Yeah. And he's delivering... Uh, <laughs> it's wait, like... what is it? Phone books or something? Something like, like that. It's something, like, really... S or maybe it's insane. Yeah, I don't know. He kind of sounds like um, like like one of those uh, what do you call them? Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> or something. <laughs> I did not think you were going that way. Um, anyway, Stesic, fascinating character. What does it mean? What is that? <laughs> well, I mean, um, yeah, I, I. What does it mean? Like, um, I I suppose that um. It's almost like there's uh, somehow even like goodness can be sort of over, like weaponized yeah. almost into this thing that actually like you can try to adhere to this goal of perfection so much that you uh, in your dogged pursuit of perfection, you completely like engender the opposite reaction from other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's sort of like, a, I, you know, it's the same reason why everyone kind of uh, hates the person that uh, needs to do 100% of the group project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It And it kind of brings us back to uh, maybe this theme of sort of the individual versus the collective mm. and how uh, it is... Um, like Stesic very strongly individualizing himself. Mm, okay, yeah. Um, I, like I, he takes responsibility for everything. Yeah, where he just sees himself as like uh, needing to be like seeing himself um, as, yeah, as like needing to be um, the prime mover of mm. uh, <laughs> of all the goodness in the world or something. Um but he, I, I, there is, I forget what the description exactly in the book is, but there is a kind of self-awareness that he gains. Yeah, I think, I vaguely remember it in a note, maybe, where it's, it describes a point in his life where he encounters this version of himself, or, like, sees this version of himself and realizes that he's, like, I don't know, stealing other people's agency or something. Yeah. Um, in one of the one of the notes and asides at the end is uh, Wallace imagines I think Fogel as becoming a kind oh, of adult okay. aesthetic. Mm. As um, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that aesthetic, you know, becomes I don't know, is more normal and chill. Um, it would be funny if, like, he <laughs> made Stesic into, like, a burnout <laughs> to, yeah, just mirror, like, to yeah. have those two guys. Um, but that's uh, not outlined. While we're on the subject of kind of childhoods, traumatic childhoods, like, uh, broadly speaking, you can talk about specific ones, but what do you think the effect of 
uh, or what's the purpose, I guess, of showing these, I, we've used the word tra traumatic, I'll use another word, sort of grotesque experiences within childhood. Like, what effect or purpose do you think that's kind of having on informing the readers of? Well, so, I mean, like, the one that obviously comes to mind is the, the Tony Ware, I think that's name story um it's like the mother and daughter story that to me like kind of is the foil of the the kid that kisses himself <laughs> um, oh, interesting or it's like a it's like a father-son story i don't know they have like yeah. kind of foilness to them um but like there's just like parts in that they're so fucking horrible um i i mean like like as a narrative i i see the purpose of it in uh detailing where these characters start and where they end up it like helps give you the whole um fucking arc of them but like i don't know i think it's really interesting to see because like uh throughout the story i again and again it's talking about this like this distinction between like this infantile state of of being versus this like adult state of being <laughs> um and this like conflict between the two and again and again it's showing characters who as children are not conforming to those standards or like a few of them are but most of them are kind of like supplanting their parents in 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 weird ways so like obviously we just discussed with stesic um the kid who's like kissing himself it like goes over and over about how his dad is kind of like feeling more and more like a failure in his life he's he i think he describes himself yeah. as tortured versus like he describes his son as dutiful like, there's this idea of this kid who's, like, so focused on this, like, stupid pursuit of kissing every part of his body. But, like, yeah. he's so powerfully, like, determined in this, like, quest that he is somehow, like, more of an adult than his dad. Um, and then the Tony Ware story, it's, it's interesting because, it, like, it kind of blends together these generations because it talks about her grandma, her mom, and her... And, like, in this, like, weaving tapestry of, like, all these women's lives, they're just, like, this horrible generational trauma of, like, constantly being used uh, as sexual objects and 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 being objectified. Um, and as just, as a foil uh, aside, the, uh, uh, the contortionist boy's father is having, like, uh, perpetual affairs. yeah perpetual affair and, and like <laughs> and like a weird music. pathological affair yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and so yeah that's another uh, yeah it's a weird foil there. don't necessarily understand and, and in the tony ware story like the the way that she's different from her mom is interesting to me because like I never it's never quite clear to me how she ends up being who she is in the story She's such a strange character to me. Like, I don't never, ever understand her motivations as an adult person. Yeah. Well, there's the one scene at the end I, that I actually, like, I'm still not entirely clear what she's doing. Or I, I like, I know she's, what she's she doing, but I don't know why she's doing it. She's at a gas station. Yeah, she's at a gas station. She's calling, she... she's making an order for copper tubing, which is described earlier. She knows how to kill trees using copper tubing. So, like, presumably she's preparing to kill trees for some reason. Yeah. And then she goes into the gas station. She has, like, a pleasant encounter with the cash register lady. She buys dog food or something. Then she goes outside, wipes a giant snot booger on her fucking lapel, goes to the manager, like, through the back to, like, tell him that the cast register lady, like, defiled her with her, like, disgusting boogers for no reason, and then leaves in, like, a fit of, of like, I don't know. I have no idea what that section is about. Yeah. It's, like, mind-boggling to me. I love it, but I have no idea. No fucking clue. Yeah, she's, um... She's definitely an enigma to me. Yeah, she... Well, and, you know, she's... Yeah, she's uh, from a simplest. horrifying traumatic history. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was just, you know, just going to say she really is, like... Um, like, I see why they included her in in the book, but it's also a character you could have completely cut because there's... She doesn't directly impact anything except she, like, sets... Um, she sets Cusk off on, like, another sweat thing 
by just like being there. She like sits behind him during the yeah, but orientation. Is he imagining that it's I can't remember. she's really there. It's her okay. that's there, and he's imagining some like beautiful foreign model. Okay. okay. So just like her presence sets him off. He doesn't actually like experience her as a person. And then she's in some other place. Oh, she's also described as, as well. So there's another section that describes the like, her mother's murder. They're like driving. Somebody runs them off the road. Maybe it's not quite clear. They're like racing down the road and drive off it. And then the person comes up to them and and she plays dead because she she has learned as a child to like completely play dead. And she, like, has auto-lubricating eyes because of it. And she plays dead so well that the guy, like, murders her mother but, like, leaves her for dead. Yeah. And, and then it mentions that David Foster Wallace is really uncomfortable with her. <laughs> yeah, is, just, is that one of the I, notes on the sides? Or I think that... that's actually in the, the actual writing of that okay. bit. I think. Okay. I, th I wrote it down in that section, so I don't think it was in a footnote or a note. Yeah. That's funny. It's very interesting. I like. I am not entirely sure what to think about her as a character in her section. Uh, I will say though, I love. There's a piece in it that's not really the same as any of the other ones, other childhood stories. Mm -hmm. Um, the writing of of that first of chapter eight, I think it is, is like really fucking beautiful. That was the first time I like noticed how f just fucking good he is at writing. <laughs> like I always, I always realize it, but like this was a really powerful section for me. Um, and there's this, the there's a mention of reflections again, um, where she like looks into a a window of a car where I think inside her mom is having sex. Getting it on. Yeah. yeah, and so she's like looking through the window, but seeing her reflection and the things inside the car reflecting on her. It's yeah. like a, uh, I love I love the constant like mirror and reflections that are discussed. But then there's also a moment that kind of put this in context for me. Um, it describes in a quick line what her and her mom look like on an IRS tax form, <laughs> which for me was like a, the beginning of understanding what what the pieces of the irs and the the is this like process of ex process of examination can really mean in the perspective of like of infinite data and like trying to focus and read through it mm -hmm. like they're like these little line notes of people that exist on forms and like all those traumas that they live through exist on those forms like you can see the way that they're making their money and like what they're paying and like clearly whatever's going on isn't like above board it's probably problematic whatever they're going through but it doesn't at all include any of the details of their lives which is what the whole section is about is yeah like all these little pieces of of their trauma yeah well it's no now that you bring that up uh, that wasn't something i noticed but it's interesting to um i forget which um uh, which section it in it's in, but there's this notion of, uh, and this is something that really resonated with me this time around, but obviously not enough to remember which section it's from. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I I want to say it's an, another Chris Vogel thing, but it's the idea of, um, like there's too much information and 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 you can end up over reading things. Mm -hmm. Um, which is something I've been thinking about, um, I don't know, in, in my own daily life and sort of like what kind of, what kind of, uh, data phantoms am I <laughs> creating, uh, when I read just like too many hot takes on Twitter or yeah, too many, uh, for sure. um, when I'm seeing too much of the commentary basically, hmm. um, in sort of what extra yeah phantoms and maps and and in one of the concepts i've been thinking about is like uh i think it's a baudrillard thing the map and the territory are you familiar with this um i don't know if he invokes this borges story but there's this borges story about uh, a map of a place uh becoming that sounds like more a, familiar. yeah 
uh, like as large as I'm butchering this. I should probably cut this out. It's a um, to scale map. Yeah, uh, like of the territory. Anyway, and so how I would describe uh, like today's world is that oh, the map is greater than the territory now. Yeah, we have it's so far, big. We have exponentially more yeah. maps than of actual territory. That's that's interesting to me. Like the that notion and the reason why I think this this book is so important for this. Uh, at one point it mentions it discusses the name of like the information age i don't know where it says that it's some part like literally the information age uh, yeah it discusses like the name calling this era the information age and how that's not appropriate i don't remember mm, um sounds familiar. That, 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 yeah it's somewhere anyway we call this the information age there's like this this f fucking just solid matter that feels like just like this oppressed like a cloud that's hanging over all it reminds me of the matrix where you're just like there is no sun anymore we've blotted out the sun with just the cloud which is like just fucking information for days none of it is true all of it is true and it's just omnipresent and pressing down on us and will keep just like pushing us down into the fucking earth like i i love the <laughs> there's a story that is talking about that <laughs> but but I also don't know, like, his path through it. Like, when he says, like, for the character of Sylvanshine, which is, I think, the like, the perfect character of yeah. somebody who's not able to really uh, piece out relevant data all the time, or mm -hmm. a relevant Chris Vogel, um, who, like, there's, there's just this, like, constant, like, fact paralysis or whatever decision paralysis because of too many facts where it's like i can't i can't stop uh or like filter the knowledge i receive mm -hmm. and it it stains me like the the yeah. mental processes i have are more sluggish because of all the data i can't hold in my head yeah and it's um well there's an interesting connection that uh, in the aa sections of infinite jest um, and because this is also a, a term that's thrown around or was thrown around a lot in, um, in various, uh, sporting ventures in my life, but, uh, uh, paralysis by over analysis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a very, it's both a very AA thing and a very, uh, like sports coach thing. Um, that, that there's this, um, and it's funny, there's, uh, there's a certain NBA player that um, kind of got that way at the end of last year. Oh, Do you know shit. Who ben Simmons is at all? No, not at all. Okay, so he's an Australian basketball player, and he's considered to be this, um, you know, really talented, right. up and coming. Uh, he's been to the All Star games a couple times, and then he just kind of had, uh, like, the pressure just got to him, yeah. obviously, last year in the playoffs. And he passed up at one point, like, basically a wide open. <sighs> Uh, layup, yeah. and he just made an extra pass, um, and uh, to to another so, player to like to air. okay, <laughs> um, who and anyway, so it's this whole thing, and he's been sitting out this whole year because um, uh, he's uh, basically said I don't want to play for this team anymore because like they don't believe in me or something he, he's being a really weird baby about it yeah honestly. well I mean like I'm sure it's like some kind of identity crisis for him yeah <laughs> so he well, has to like externalize it <laughs> yeah well and what's interesting is that um it's almost like it was contagious because on this same oh team, shit on the wait Space Jam no on the 76ers a couple years before there was a guy named Markel Fultz and um okay do you know what the yips are no wait sounds familiar okay is this uh, a term in infinite it's just a sports related term okay um sometimes it's attributed to kickers sometimes to pitchers in baseball or uh, you know like you'll essentially have like a mental block to where you can't throw a ball normally where you're like over analyzing every little sort of movement and, it, and it's basically it's a result of some kind of trauma um and there have been a number of different uh baseball players that have gotten it um and there was this it, it's still kind of unclear but markel fultz was the number one overall pick and he was considered just a sure thing basically 
and uh, there were, I don't, it, it's tough to figure out, but basically he like started overthinking his shot and he developed, like he couldn't, basically couldn't shoot a jump shot anymore his I rookie year. Uh, and so he had all these weird hitches um, and it might have started out as like a physical thing. Right. But in his like training back, you know, he there's all these expectations on him. Yeah. Um, that he's uh, uh, like he's literally shooting free throws and he's like hitching a couple times um, and he can't like get it up in the air enough to hit the rim from the three point line. Um, uh, anyway, so he like went through that and Ben Simmons was on kind of that team. And then a couple of years later, um, uh, Ben Simmons has this just kind of, uh, performative meltdown in the playoffs. And then, uh, he like, you know, it, it's Philadelphia. So they are booing him, in the playoffs <laughs> and they hate him. throwing beer cans or something. <laughs> it's probably throwing batteries at it. <laughs> batteries. <there> and, it <laughs> Uh, he was just like, uh, you know what? Then I'm done. I went out of Philadelphia. And so he has been fined tens of millions of dollars basically oh, for not showing up. He's basically forfeited a bunch of his salary this year. Um, don't worry. He makes like $30 yeah. million dollars a year. Um, a bunch of it's already in the bank. Uh, anyway, he just got traded, though, today. Today was the trade deadline, and they actually traded him. And so he is going to get a new team and he's going to get a new shot and I mean for him fuck yeah now it's like okay buddy yeah you have nothing you else got yeah. what you wanted the other thing he's been doing is he's been using he's been saying um uh he's not ready to report to the 76ers because of mental health issues and there's it's a pretty cynical deployment of it it really feels like it um cuz he's also just trying to force his way out of the situation um, but, uh, anyway, he's, he's going to Brooklyn now, so have fun with that. That's man. fucking crazy to me. Like I, that was one of the things that I was, when I was reading infinite jests and never finishing infinite jest, infinitely reading it. Um, the more like infinite regress. <laughs> um the the thing that kept getting me was like i have never thought about sports in like an intellectual way at all before i i read that book and ever since then i can't I stop have only ever thought about sports in an intellectual that's the that's the problem like i didn't like sports i think until i read that book and then like i oh, can't that's interesting. like i i started playing ping pong recently this last year Oh. And like I love it. It's so good. <laughs> but there's moments like that where like I I just overanalyze all the oh, time. Yeah. And that like was... it makes me realize it in all the other things I do. Like I know I'm doing that all the time yeah. because that's why I'm the kind of person I am. But like what does that mean? Like what are the things that like I'm hiccuping on all the time because of it? I don't know. Everything probably. I no, I and I was the kind of athlete that, um, like, absolutely just psyched himself out all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I just in a variety of different ways. And I also just think I psych myself out in, like, regular life. Yeah. And in writing, and, definitely. Like, yeah. Uh -huh. Gosh, let's... Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, it's not that bad. With writing, it's just... You have, laborious. like, a pretty thick novel over there. I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I think guess. you left it open on your computer so that I would lock it and see. Yes, <laughs> I, I wanted you to see how big my <laughs> file was. Uh, no, it's perpetually open on, like, that screen. That's kind of the it joy of it. you in the face, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, look, uh, David Foster Wallace called this the long thing. I know that and, terrifies me. Uh, and it killed him. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It was, uh, it was probably his bitch of an ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> what all those college <laughs> students he had to teach um uh but just that you know that whole uh anxiety um and and over analysis uh and uh, <laughs> trauma coming 
there from uh was just like uh kind of a huge um it it was one of those things that um you talked about it earlier it's like you you finally feel understood mm. yeah um, you like oh my god you know people are as like as interiorly insane <laughs> if not more so yeah. than i am yeah and it's not that like it's not like there's a solution to how yeah no obviously that, not. that you get rid of it but it's like just knowing that that is also out there and experienced um even if you can just kind of know and be more familiar with that um it takes some of the fear away i think mm. um that uh one of the things that i definitely learned um you know in therapy while i was because uh, i would also talk about this book with my therapist <laughs> as you can imagine <laughs> um and uh so i'm sure that that also just had another kind of reinforcing um uh, effect on why it became so important to me because it was like one of the things I part wanted to of talk your about therapy every, <laughs> yeah every week um and one of the things that i wanted to process um but uh wait I, I just I wanted to dig a little deeper into this so the the depression that you were describing earlier that that big depression that brought you to this was that an outcome of that you your troubles with sports no oh, okay. okay no no this was i mean i was into college at this point gotcha um no i i you know i think i uh i i i was okay with where i ended up with sports <laughs> okay. i like um no it, it it was something else that i won't get into um but uh uh yeah, one of the things that I just learned was like, at the very least, you got to talk about what you're afraid of. And I think that I was someone that always, always, always tried to keep things inside me. Yeah. And tried to figure them out in my head. Right. Yeah. And um, at a certain point, I couldn't just figure out certain things in my head, mm. namely how to like keep myself happy. Um, and, uh, you know, it had a bad sort of cascading effect. And so, but sort of my, one of my wrapping up thoughts is that, um, uh, I think that, so that strategy of, uh, speaking your fear or, or talking about it or seeing it identified in a novel, um, ends up kind of like, it's not the, to, to bring it back to my invocation, it's not the solution you hoped for, but it's the solution you got. And it actually, like, it's not something you can simulate in your mind. It's something that you just have to, like, literally live and speak out and then wait until you kind of get on the other side of it. And then it's not... It, and, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's like, it's kind of a perspective shift, but it only happens once it's actually lived and not merely thought through. That's really interesting. I, I, w I was wondering, the, the very last chapter, the very last section. Yeah, that, like, mindfulness. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, is that, I almost attribute it to that, which is interesting that that's the very last. Uh, you almost attribute it to what? the the very last chapter section where i'm not entirely sure what's happening or about to happen but it feels like that like it feels kind of like the book is asking or that chapter at least is asking you to go through this process of mindfulness yeah over um, yourself or whatever yeah is about to happen in this, <laughs> this subsection yeah yeah i think um, you are I, a trained observer and there is nothing to observe. <laughs> That's the only quote I have from it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, uh, no, it seems, um, and I don't know. I mean, I imagine they might have had stuff like this in the 80s. But, like, 
you know, you bring in a yoga instructor or something <laughs> or a meditation expert for a day at your office and like that's one of your office perks or something. <laughs> and so um I uh da, 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 da. Yeah, because the office could be any office. Cove fluorescence on a dimmer, modular shelving. The desk practically an abstraction. The whisper of sourceless ventilation. Da, 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 da. And then there's your line. You're, you are a trained observer, and there is nothing to observe. Um, there's a... Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember. I feel like it's a... Maybe it's another. There's also yeah the also the one that that's coming to mind as you talk about that is the other section the I've mentioned multiple times where it's like this kid who his goal in life is to kiss every part of his body. Yeah. And um, in this section it also talks about his dad, which you mentioned, but it also discusses the chiropractor that's helping him. And which doctor? S- um, which doctor? Oh, is that what you said? Or yeah, which W-O-T-C-H. chapter? Oh. This is an anti uh chiropractor's yeah. podcast. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, um, gotcha. But yes, what about the witch doctor? <laughs> um, chiropractor he comes from a guy that said ghosts taught it to him. Well, this book is talking about how ghosts are real, so Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh but like so in this section the chiropractor sees this kid as this kind of like child prodigy of chiropractory yeah. chiropracty chiropractation. Whereas, like, which doctor is? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, and like his pursuit of of like slowly discovering himself, or whatever it is, in this like very physical way, is like this process. This almost like met- methodical, uh, methodical, meditative. meditative Zen practice of like becoming to terms with the universe. Or what she describes, because in the same section it describes her idea of the universe and humanity in the universe, which is like the common, like new agey belief that like experience or human experience, living experience is the universe experiencing itself. Like it's the way that the universe is given to experience itself. So like it talks about that and and funnels it through this idea of a kid whose examination of himself is ongoing and impossible to finish because he will never kiss his own lips. <laughs> but yeah, like, or I, you know, or eyeballs, like fucking back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. His eyeballs, yeah, <laughs> his ears. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, and that's like, uh, no, that's a really, um, that's a really beautiful uh, kind of uh, thing to end on. Um, how, again, we approach this uh, thing that is impossible to finish right um uh, this task like we know it it must be impossible to finish but there is um uh i there I, there was uh some youtuber that i was watching recently was talking about how um you know you always need to be sort of shooting for like if you're making a piece of art, right, you need to be uh, shooting for like some ideal, and your your actual art will never reach that ideal. You'll always be able to remember it or think of it as more perfect than it you can ever actually bring it into being, and yet you you have to bring it into the world anyway, kind of thing. You you gotta attempt. That's what my uh, uh, Mark Schiffer, uh, where are you at, Hello. Shift Dog, represent Shift Dog. Uh, Mark Schiffer wrote. Oh, um, is he? Uh, I don't know. The congressman? No, he's. Uh, <laughs> what? Adam Schiff. Um, Mark Schiffer is a screenwriter who uh, I was taught by at grad school. Um, he's, what grad school is that, dude? It was a grad school that I won't even plug because fuck them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, but Shift Dog, um, Sh- Mark Schiffer always connected it to like, uh, oh my God, I don't even remember the name of it, the parable of the frog. That, God, what's it called? Zeno's paradox. Oh, Zeno's paradox. Yeah. It, so like each time a frog. I, I don't it's know Achilles why I thought of a frog. The tortoise. Tortoise. Okay. Yeah. 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 Come yeah. On, All right. Hey, I'm getting there. 
go ahead. I will never get there, but I'm getting there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, your your end goal is like, okay, I'm going to write a screenplay. This is what it's about. Everything that it's about, all the cool ideas. And then your process of getting there is you write your first draft, you get halfway there. You write your second draft, you get another half of the way there. And then halfway, halfway, you never get there. But you get closer and closer until almost it's like so minuscule that it's like it doesn't really matter that yeah. you didn't get there. But like you're close. Ship dog. Uh, shout out ship dog. <laughs> um, Luke, is there anything else uh, that you wanted to talk about in regards to this book? Mm, I mean, yeah, there's like infinite things that I could talk about, but I think, I think mostly I want to leave it at that. I think that's a really good place to end it. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Don't kill yourself. Oh, if you've if you've ever seen my YouTube videos, you know that I like purposefully just discordantly end them at awkward spots. Oh, that's spots. good. That's yeah. good. Because that's, yeah, uh, that's the, the whole thing. So, uh, uh, Luke, thanks for having this conversation hey, you're with welcome. me. It was a good conversation. I'm sure uh, that we will continue to have conversations about this book and many others. Dun, 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 dun. Sing us out, Luke. I think that was... Just I think make that, it up as you go. I think that that was McDonald's jingle. <laughs> you're, you're Wayne Brady. Just just, uh, just sing us out. We talked about a book. It was very, very fun. We talked about it good. But we'll never get done. <laughs>